Hola mi gente, welcome to Dasha Sazon, Chisme in the Kitchen. We are going to be making for you today Lomo Saltado, which is one of the most famous dishes from Peru. It's my husband's favorite, it's my favorite, it's a lot of people's favorite, and it's also the favorite of my friend Jackie, who is here with me. Hi, how are Hi, you? Hi, this is Jackie. Nice to see you. Yeah, she's a good friend of mine. Oh, oh. We lost a light, guys. She's a good friend of mine from Miami. As you can see, she's got her Cuban bread, Martha of Miami shirt. Shout right. out to Martha of Miami. If you're not familiar with them, they're a brand based in Miami, and they have all kinds of Latino-themed shirts, um, accessories, all kinds of clothes, especially Cuban, but the Cuban bread one is my favorite, and they mine have too. a Puerto Rican bread shirt that I need to get because I've been eyeing it on Instagram for the longest. Um, so we're gonna make some lomo saltado here. Yeah, Jackie has been kind enough to let us use her beautiful Airbnb today. So you can see we're in a different kitchen than where we normally are. We've got a little bit of a different layout, but I think it's gonna look really beautiful. Um, do you wanna show us around really quick? Sure, or we could just get to the cooking, whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, you know what, let's get to the cooking, and then while we're doing some other things, we'll look around and we'll talk about it. Um, so we're gonna first get started with our lomo. So the elements of lomo saltado. Lomo is lomo fino, and so that's gonna be your filet mignon. So we have some right here that we cut up already. And so lomo saltado is gonna be your filet mignon steak that's stir fried over high heat, and then we're gonna have some tomatoes, some red onions, and aji amarillo. Aji amarillo is this right here. It's a Peruvian yellow pepper. It is spicy, but it is so important to the flavor of this dish, so you gotta have it. Um, so we'll just make sure that we don't put too, too much in there. And so we're gonna start off with um, the elements of that. So we got that. You also serve it on top of rice, and you serve it with French fries. So when the first time I went to Peru, I think maybe the first time I went to um, a Peruvian restaurant, my husband was, then boyfriend at the time was like, oh yeah, I want, it's gonna come with rice and mashed potatoes or rice and french fries. I'm like, that's starch on starch, this makes no sense. Like, do you guys just eat carbs all day? They do. Back in the, <laughs> back in the olden days, in the Andes, they're climbing all those mountains, they're climbing all those stairs, you know, like Stairway to Heaven or Coco Head, where it's just stairs all the way up. That's what they were doing out there. They were they were one of the first cultures to have um, their own postal service, and they used to do it actually on foot, going up and down the stairs. So we're gonna start off with that, with the potato. Fun fact, if you didn't know, potatoes originated in Peru, or at least what is today Peru. It was really, you know, the Incan Empire, uh, all the empires that existed before that. So Peru claims it, Ecuador claims it, Chile claims it. It's that region. This is where potatoes come from. They don't come from Ireland. So to show you how to make our own french fries. So you can use frozen french fries if you want to, but if you want to make it a little bit sasson style, you want to really do it up, you want to make your own french fries. So right here, I've got some potatoes that we slice. This is the size that we're looking for. So one of the things that I love about Peruvian cooking is presentation is everything. So they make sure that the french fries are always cut up in these perfect little rectangles like this. So I'm going to show you how to make them like that. If you don't want to use uh, potatoes, Peru is watching. Hola a todos en Peru. I'm so excited that you guys are here. Um, this is a dish that I learned how to make when I was in Peru the first time. Um, my mi suegra, she taught me. Our cousin Paco, who's a chef in Peru, he showed me the right way to do it. Um, and then also your tío, who has his own farm. The best lomo salta I ever had in my life was from his farm that he actually picked the aji amarillos and the potatoes and the uh, meat itself was from like a farm next door. So everything was so fresh, had just been picked that day. I don't know when the cow was killed, but recently. Um, and it was the most delicious thing. So I'm gonna show you real quick how to do the potatoes so that they're in these perfect little rectangles like this. So you got your potato. Obviously it's not rectangular. We've got rounded sides on all sides. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off the round sides. So we're gonna cut off one end and cut off the other end. Now we've got a flat surface. Anytime you're cutting anything round, you wanna make a flat surface as soon as possible because if you're cutting with a rounded edge, it's so easy for something to, to roll and slip. So we get that flat edge down, cut off that round side, and cut off this. Now we've got ourselves a nice kind of rectangular thing. You can cut off these sides if you want to. I find it fine, I like a little bit of skin on there. Um, for this, you don't have to peel the potatoes. So we toss that out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come right down the middle Cut it in half and then cut that half in half. So we got four this way. So we cut it into four like that. 
and then let's separate it two and two again flat sides so we don't want to cut with that rounded side down that's how you chop off your finger put the flat side down and then we're going to cut that into thirds so one and two and then again with the other side one and two so now we've got beautiful french fry pieces so we're going to add that to our other potatoes and if you follow me over here we're going to move over to the stove and we're going to so i'm going to switch the camera for you guys so you can see how it is when we fry these up so right here we've got our nice hot oil going so we're going to put these in let's start off with just one because potatoes are wet and you know oil and water don't mix so you don't want to just drop something wet into your oil without checking it first so we're just going to drop these bad boys in don't be scared just be careful don't drop from a high uh height so if you're scared and you start throwing things in that's how you're going to splatter you're going to bring yourself don't do that so we get those in so french fries the way that you make these is any french fry you have is going to be fried twice so we do this first fry like this this is a medium high heat so that our oil is not super super hot we start off with this kind of lower heat this is what's going to cook your potato in the inside and then the second fry is going to be over higher heat and that's what's going to get you crispy on the outside so we're going to put in about half of the potatoes we're going to do that in two batches because we don't want to overcrowd our pan. You see now the whole one layer is taken up. Now that that's all filled, that's all the space we got in the pool. So we're gonna just pop that there and we're gonna let that go while we start with our rice as well. Come with me right here. So I've got some white jasmine rice that I have rinsed and um, into a colander. So the old school way, and the way a lot of people do it is dump it into a bowl, put water on it, and then pour it out into your hand. That's the way my mom showed me how to do it. My husband, the smart guy that he is, was like, why don't you just use a strainer? And then that way you don't lose the rice and you can just pull it out. So what I do is I put rice in here in a strainer and put that in a bowl, fill it with water, then just pour it out and you can use that same water to rinse it again or you can just move it out the way. So we've got our rice here and then we've got our garlic. So we've got some garlic sliced up. So I sliced this up thin uh, I figured it would be fine to do this off camera, but just so you guys see, we've got some nice thin slices like this. So when you're slicing garlic, you want to use a very sharp knife. I'm using this one. A bigger knife is great for garlic, um, and you want to put a, the flat side of the garlic down, and you want to slice it pretty quickly. Really important, and I talked about this last week. If you've never sharpened your knives before, your knives are dull. You need to sharpen your knives. This is something that I didn't know until I started really cooking, but everybody should be sharpening their knives once or twice a year. So what I do is I kind of um, put it to the holidays. So right before Thanksgiving, I get my knives sharpened and then I do it again uh, when school gets out. So those are kind of the times where I make, um, I make sure that my knives are sharpened to make sure they're sharp. If you're not doing as much cooking as me, one is good. Just make sure you get it sharpened for Thanksgiving. It's easy to remember. So I'm gonna, um, we've got our pot over here for our garlic. I'm going to flip it over for you, rub it. We've got some olive oil here. And we're gonna pop that in. And this is the way you do Peruvian garlic rice. A little bit different than the Filipino way. So we've got some olive oil. We're gonna drop in this garlic. And you can see here that our french fries are ready to come out so we've got this one's got a little bit of color on it but the other ones are still pretty pale that's fine that's what we want we don't want it to brown too too much because we're just trying to cook the inside so let's take these out and we'll drop in the others and then we've got our garlic and our oil cooking back there and that's for our rice so we pull these out it's also really important for this to use yellow potatoes. The yellow potatoes that they have in Peru, sadly, they don't have here in the United States. Um, at least not here in Hawaii. In Miami, you probably could find it. And maybe California. Any place where we got a lot of Peruvians, I'm sure they're getting those in there somewhere. Um, here, you can find the frozen kinds, but because they're frozen, they're not going to be good for french fries. They'll be good for something like a mashed potato or a calpsa. But the Peruvian yellow potato, it looks a lot different than ours. It's it's uh, smaller, it's rounder, and it's very bumpy. So it looks very brown on the outside. You know, our yellow potatoes, our Yukon gold potatoes, have yellow skin. Peruvian yellow potatoes don't have yellow skin. They have a very brown skin. So they don't look from the outside like they're going to be yellow on the inside. So if you're looking, if you're in a Peruvian market and you're looking for potatoes that look yellow, 
they're not gonna look yellow they're gonna look like rocks um that's another thing is that the potatoes and all all your produce and food is gonna look a lot more rustic your carrots are gonna be big and bumpy and fat all your potatoes are gonna be super bumpy none of the picture perfect smooth stuff that we're used to here okay so our garlic you can see back here is nice and golden yeah so i'm gonna throw that in there and then now we've got our rice so let's add in our rice and then we are going to come up behind you and i'm gonna stir this up so I, in here I've got two cups of rice because we are cooking with friends today and I want to make sure that they have plenty of food when we leave because they've been so gracious to let us use their Airbnb. I want to make sure they are well fed by the time we get out of here. And this is our favorite. And this is their favorite food. So they're excited for this. So I've got some salt here. This is coarse sea salt. I buy this at Costco. That's my favorite kind of salt is coarse sea salt. A lot of people use kosher salt. Kosher salt is also great. I like the sea salt has like a little bit more of a punch. So adding some salt in there. And then I'm gonna add in some water. So we've got some water right here. So I'm just gonna add in about three cups of water. That should be enough for what we need. You can go up to four cups if you want to. And then I'm gonna turn the heat up to high on this. Okay? And so it looks like our second batch of french fries are also ready to come out. So let's take these out. Okay, so let's get all the kitties out of the pool. And so now that these are fried the first time, we're gonna stick them in the freezer. So when you buy your french fries uh, in the freezer aisle, this first fry is already done. That's why when you get them, you can just pop them in the oven or you can fry them yourself. Um, the reason why we do this is we want them to cool down and we want, all, we want them to kind of dry out a little bit. So this is good. So if you're making this at home, I, what I like to do is I do this the day before and then I pop it in the freezer overnight. So we'll put those in there and we'll let those freeze while we do everything else. So we'll just make sure that oil is not too, too hot. So we're gonna just lower it down for now and we'll heat it back up when it's time. And then our simple syrup. We've got some simple syrup going here. So this is just one cup of sugar and one cup of water. And we have those going for pisco sours later. So you know what, let's also stick this in the freezer so that our pisco sours are not too hot later. So let's just stick this up in the top. Let's stick it down here in the bottom. Nice and safe. Be high. So we have got our rice going. So we seared it with the garlic, the garlic and the oil over medium heat. And then we added in the rice, we added in the salt and the water, and I turned the heat up to high. So I'm waiting for it to boil behind me. As soon as I see it boiling, or if you see it boiling first, just be like, hey girl, it's boiling in the comments. And I'll turn around and do that. As soon as that's boiling, we're gonna turn it to low and we're gonna cover it. So the next thing that we are gonna do is show you our steak. So I already sliced up some steak here, but I left one here for you guys so that you can have a look. So this is the most important part of the lomo. So everybody pay attention right now. The steak you use is what's gonna make or break this dish. If you've been to a lot of different Peruvian restaurants, you may have had the unfortunate experience of tasting a lomo saltado made with cheap steak. If you're gonna start cheap, just you might as well just pack it up, throw it away because that's not it's not gonna work it's not gonna work it's not gonna be what you want and the quality of the steak is gonna determine the quality of the dish so what you put in the beginning is what you're gonna get out at the end you start cheap you end cheap so for this we're using actual filet mignon so filet mignon is also called beef tenderloin tenderloin steak not to be confused with sirloin or tender steak or whatever else they try and use to get you to buy the cheap steaks this is gonna be the most expensive steak. So for us, what we did was we bought this at Costco because Costco has it for pretty good prices. They have it for about $20 a pound, which is still expensive, but Whole Foods had it for $30 a pound. So, I mean, you can do it however you want to because Whole Foods, they probably have the grass fed, they got the organic and stuff. For our purposes, we just got it from Costco, but Costco is pretty good meat. So 
the reason why it matters is because this dish is going to cook really fast so you want something that's going to be really tender so i just want to show you how to cut it up into the correct pieces so usually i buy a whole tenderloin for this and i cut it up um they didn't have that they had the steaks cut up into um already cut up into filet mignon steaks so that's fine so what we want to do is we're looking for pieces that are about this kind of size like an inch by two inches or two by three inches however thick you want to do it so i'm going to use our nice sharp knife and we're just going to cut off pieces like this so i'll add that to what we've got here so what i like to do is i like to cut it about as thick as i want um as wide as i want it to be thick so i cut a big piece like this and then i turn that sideways and then cut that into thick slices so that way when i'm left i've got pieces like this these sear up really nicely because they're flat on one side they've got a lot of surface area and they're gonna make for a nice crisp outside really important to get your outside nice and crisp so on that note let's heat up our wok behind us we're putting it up on its highest heat because we need this to be hot 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 because we're gonna sear it so searing a steak or searing anything else is cooking it on its highest heat and getting a good browning on the outside so last week i told you guys about the mallard reaction the mallard reaction is what happens when meat touches a very hot surface it's also called caramelization so when you put a steak into a hot pan and you see that browning that's called the mallard reaction that's what makes things taste good so our caveman ancestors discovered that and that's when they were like raw food is not for me this is it's going to be cooked food from here on out and now so that's what makes it um a lot healthier because it makes the it increases the calorie count um it makes it uh easier for us to, to digest because we're not really meant to eat raw meat um ricky sent me sent me a request um so now that we've got huh oh okay let me see ricky my uncle who i love so much this is his favorite dish so he asked if he can come in on the live so ricky do you want to be in the video because if i turn it on you're gonna be in the video but let's see let's see and no hard feelings if you're like no i don't want to be on camera right now but that's what that means you'll be on camera and everyone will see you but if you want to we can do that <laughs> hey ricky so this is my uncle ricky this is my mom's brother and uh growing up he lived with us and he was always like a second father to me he was ricky was my everything um, and I love him so much. And so he is here watching us cook. Um, so I'm gonna, you wanna say hi to everybody? No, thank you, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I should know how to do it. Okay, so you gotta, I think you have to, oh, and Sylvia says family. Sylvia is our cousin. Um, she is another member of our family who we love so much. And um, Sylvia, if you ever want to go live with me as well, we can uh, have you, we can add you in there. So if you wanna say bye, Ricky, I'll take you off so that you can just chill and watch it. I love you so much. Okay. Go. I got it. Okay. I'm so glad that you joined us. He, Ricky, he's always been so fun. He's He was the source of like all my fun as a child. He took a sledding. He would show up to all the parent teacher conferences. He did, he just did everything with us. And when I needed, anytime I've needed someone in my life, Ricky has always been there and he's never turned his back on me. He's never, he never, says no if he has something to give he will give it to you um so next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna mix the sauce that we need for this so very important with normal saltado you want to have everything ready to go so i'm just gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see what i've got here i've got everything already chopped up and ready to go so that when it's time to start hitting the heat everything is ready to go so we so that's nice and hot that's what we want i'm just gonna move out the heat for now so we'll just turn that off for now. Um, so we are going to season up this steak really quick before we do anything else. So I'm just putting it onto a plate so that we have a nice wide surface so we can make sure that everything gets seasoned properly. So I've got some salt right here. So again, with our sea salt, just going to make sure that gets nicely coated, not too much. And then we'll add another layer on top. And this is how we can make sure that everybody gets equally seasoned. So we got some right here on our filet mignon. Asia, if they can't afford filet mignon, what's another good steak that they can use? Yes, so I know I said, you know, you gotta use the best that you can. 
Um, but my other favorite to use when I don't use filet mignon with this is ribeye. So if you can get a nice thick boneless ribeye, that works also works really great with this dish. Another cut that works really well for this is flank steak. Flank steak is also pretty tender um, and does react really well with this cooking process. So we got a little bit of ground pepper. I'm all the time, I'm talking about my rainbow peppercorns. So if you're gonna use your pepper, use a few different ones. Each of these has a different flavor. Your pink is gonna be fruity. Um, the black is gonna be kind of that classic spicy punch taste. And then the green is gonna have a little bit more of an herby flavor. But the mixture of all them together is gonna taste so much better than what you're gonna get with just one. So we've got our steak there and ready to go. And so now we're gonna mix the sauce that we need for our lomo saltado. So if you ever had lomo before, you know it's steak, it's got its vegetables, and then it's got this delicious, amazing sauce that coats everything. So we wanna make that first before we do anything else. So we've got four ingredients for that. This has been tried and tested. I have worked for years getting this right. The first time I made this dish, it was terrible. It, I messed it up. I had way too much soy sauce. It was so overly salty. It was awful. But my husband, he was patient. And so we made sure that we were able to, we tried and tried again. And so it took me like, I returned it back to the restaurant. <laughs> he sent it back. He was like, no, chef, this is not going to work. So these are the four ingredients that I now use. So this is the only one that might be, is a, might be a little bit different if you haven't seen this before. So this is beef base. So this is just a liquid version of the beef bouillon packets that you buy. You can also use beef broth. I like this because it's a little bit more concentrated. So we're going to throw in, we're going to have three tablespoons of that into our bowl. And then next important ingredient is our soy sauce. So I just brought a little soy sauce. I grabbed this sushi and sashimi one because it's just a little bit less salty than what you've got. Oh, our rice is boiling. Let's turn that down to low and cover it. Where's my lid? Here it is. So I've got our lid right here. Let's cover that up. Oops, flash over. Got a lot of liquid back there, so it's sizzling as hot. Okay, so soy sauce. Not as much as you think you're gonna use. Even though it's a soy sauce base, soy sauce has a strong flavor, so you do not want to overdo it. So just two tablespoons of soy sauce. And then Worcestershire sauce. This is, in Peru they call it salsa inglesa because uh, Worcestershire, Worcestershire is in England. So it's like, salsa inglesa means English sauce. So let's throw in three tablespoons of this, of our salsa inglesa. And then two tablespoons of red wine vinegar. This is gonna give the sauce a tang that it is, so that's gonna really balance things out. So it's gonna balance out kind of the richness of the Worcestershire sauce, the saltiness of the soy sauce. So it's gonna give us an extra tang that we need. Okay. Come up behind and just give this a quick wipe. Um, I can help you. Okay, we'll get that. So everything's a little bit hot over there. So our sous chef for today is Jackie, and she's gonna help us clean up behind us. So now we've got everything in a bowl right there, ready to go, ready to roll. Um, I'm actually going to pour it into a squirt bottle like this. So I like to use this when I'm doing lomo saltado because it makes it easy to just get everything, um, get everything in there. So I'm gonna pour it into this measuring cup so that we don't spill anything. We don't wanna spill anything. Get it all in there. And we're gonna pour it into the squirt bottle. Okay, so that way when it's time to roll, we've got everything ready to go. When I make this, when we make this for our dish of the week and we've got everything going, we've got it all rolling, I usually have like a huge squirt bottle like this and we're just, we're throwing it in there and it's it gets like really hot, really fast, we're moving. Um, so our other ingredients, so just real quick before we start hitting the heat, which we're about to do in like two minutes because it's, it's almost time to make the magic happen. Let me show you what our other ingredients are. So now we've got our sauce ready to go. And we've got scallions, which are green onions, the long skinny green onions that you see in the store. 
I've got some cilantro for the ends for garnish. I've got some garlic, some aji amarillo, which let me show you what that looks like. That is this. So this is a Peruvian yellow pepper. You can see it's really big. This is a frozen one. So you can see it's kind of shiny because it's defrosting. Um, if you're in South Florida or you're in an area with a lot of Peruvian people, you may be able to get it fresh. Lucky you, if you can. Um, <laughs> we cannot. So we buy it frozen. You can also buy it in a jar. Um, the only thing with buying it in the jar is it's going to be very spicy because they're just taking them and they're blending them. They're not doing anything else with them. So it's going to be really, really spicy. So we've also got some sliced red onion. Um, the red onions in Peru are different than the ones here. They're more pink and they have this like light mild flavor that's so great. And then we've got some uh, tomatoes that we have into thin slices like that. So I'm gonna show you real quick how to do the tomatoes because you don't want it to have too much liquid in it. So I'm gonna actually use, pull out my small knife. You don't need to use a big knife for every single thing. For this, we can use something small. So I've got a tomato and I'm gonna put it flat side down, always flat sides down. So let's cut off a little piece of the top so that we've got a nice flat surface, put it down and we're gonna cut it in half and then we're gonna quarter it. So now we've got four quarters like this. We're gonna take this little knife and we're gonna cut out the middle of the tomato where all the seeds are and where it's all wet. You can see all that wetness, we just wanna scoop that out. Reason why is you don't want additional liquid in your lomo because too much liquid will make the whole thing kind of soupy when you really want high heat and you want it to um, you want it to hit the fire, you want it to sear, you want it to be something that's hot, hot, hot. Oh, would you mind giving me a little piece in here? Actually, you can put it in here so that looks a little hot. So grab some piece there because that's going to be our secret ingredient. So now we cut out the middles of all our tomatoes. We can toss those. If you want to keep it, you can use that for a sauce or something. But for something like this, we want things to be a little more dry. And then we're just going to cut nice thin slices like that. You don't want humongous chunks of tomato in there because um, it's just going to overpower everything else. You want everything to be kind of uniform. You can see we've got our onion and our tomato are sliced to the same size. That's what you want. When you're stir frying, you want everything to cook at the same rate. So you want to make sure that everything is the same size. We are going to do it in a particular order though. And the tomatoes are going to go in last because if you put the tomatoes in first, they're going to dissolve. You're going to get um, the skin separating from the flesh and it's just going to be turned a little bit soupy and we don't want that. We want it to still keep its shape and we want it to still keep not crunch because tomatoes are not crunchy, but you still want it to be a little bit crisp. So now we've got our sauce um, ready to go and we're going to grab our french fries out of the freezer and we're going to get those into the oil. I'm going to turn the heat back up for that so that our french fries can go. And then we're going to do that second fry. So you see our french fries right here that we've already pre-fried. So we did our first fry. They're a little bit golden, but not too, too brown. We're going to pop those into our hot oil as we do everything else. So what's important now is to make sure we've got everything ready to go. So let's pull out a plate that we're going to use to plate everything. So the reason why you want to do this is because once you get that lomo in the pan, once you get everything going, it's going to move fast. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to sear the steak. So let's get this over here. Let's follow me right here. As you can see, I really like squirt bottles. So I put some vegetable oil in this squirt bottle and we are going to make sure that this is high heat. Let's check on our rice really quick. Our rice is just about ready to go. So we can turn down the heat on that. It's already on low, so we can leave that. We're going to let our wok get nice and hot. It got, it was really hot earlier. We don't want the smoke alarm to go off. So we want to make sure that we, uh, that we keep it not too hot. So now we're going to heat that back up. So while we're waiting for that, let's put our French fries in. So there we go. We're looking for that good sizzle. That's exactly what we want. I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit higher so that it's nice and hot. I'm going to wait until that heat is really, really hot. So that's good. I'm going to wait a second for that. So while this is a dish where you're going to do a lot of things at once. 
this is why it's good to practice and you want to have everything sliced and ready to go because if you try and do this while you're cutting stuff up something's gonna burn Smell good in a second. So one layer. Don't overcrowd the pan. Only enough to fit without touching each other. You don't want them to touch. It's not a rush. So now that we've got those in, get our french fries in. So same thing as before, and the same thing with the meat. You only want one layer. We don't want fly overboard. We don't want to overcrowd the pan because these are now cold. So as you put them in, the oil temperature is going to drop. So if we put in too much, the oil temperature will drop too much, and then we won't have our beautiful crispy fries. That's gonna go. I'm gonna grab another tray right here, and let's just stick some paper towels on that. And let's check on our meat. Let's see. Look at that. So it's a good brown, but we want to let it go a little bit further. That one looks good. So we're only gonna sear the outside. We want the inside to still stay kind of raw because we're gonna put it back in. Okay, our French fries look uh, great. They're nice and crispy. Mm -hmm. and nice and golden. This is what we want. We don't want them to burn, but we want them to have a nice golden color to them. And then now that those are out, we're going to just put a little bit of salt on top. So we've got some right here. Just throw a little salt. Not too much because everything's going to be well seasoned. And let's put in the rest of our French fries. Actually, before we do that, let's take out this steak. So we don't want it to overcook. Yes, beautiful. This is what we want on both sides. Just the outside. Okay, that's done. And we're going to put in some more. And we're just going to sear as we do french fries. We're going to sear, french fries, sear, french fries. So you can also do this first before you start slicing everything else. You can slice your steak, you can sear it, and you can set it to the side. It's fine if it sits once it's seared. That's not going to be an issue. And now we've got our other tongs here. And let's Throw in those french fries. So these are also going to be nice and quick. Make sure that they're not sticking together. They may start to stick together a little bit once they freeze because water turns to ice. They're wet. And again, like I said, you can freeze these overnight and have them completely frozen. Just be careful when you put them in because once they freeze, they're going to have little icicles on the outside. And that's water. Oil and water don't mix. You add water to hot oil, you splatter. But looks like we're doing pretty well right now. Not too hot. Okay, those are good. And let's look our steak. Beautiful. How do you know when it's time to flip? So, your steak. You know it's time to flip when you can see the brown starting to creep up the side. So if you're looking closely, you can see there's a layer of brown on the bottom. When you can see that on the side, that means it's time to flip. If you can't see that yet, it means it's not ready. Most important thing when cooking steak is high heat. If your heat is not high enough, you're going to get gray steak and it's gross. The same thing when you're cooking ground beef or any other kind of beef. You want to make sure that you've got high heat, and that's how you get that brown mallow reaction. We're going to take out the rest of our french fries. These are all done. Nice and golden. 
all crispy, ready to go. If you have a deep fryer, more power to you, use that because it makes it super easy, but you can do it like this uh, in a cast iron pan. And the reason why I'm using a cast iron pan is because they get a lot hotter than your other pans because it's heating from all sides. Another, any other pan that has a handle, even like this wok, is going to not heat up all the way around. Why the wok is good is because of the shape. The shape is going to help it to heat on all sides. So let's turn that off. Let's get this steak out. This steak's ready to roll. And then we got our last batch of steak, and then it's time to make the magic happen. And finish out the dish. I cannot wait. It smells so yes. good. I wish you guys have smelled this one. Yes. I'm having a this is great. It smells so good. So mm -hmm. that's what you want when you have that high heat. If you don't have that high heat, you're not going to hear that sound and you're not going to smell that smell. This is what you want. You want it to brown up so nicely. So the reason why I'm doing them one at a time and not dumping it in is because I want to make sure each one is touching the bottom of the pan. If I dump them in, they're gonna just dog pile on top of each other, and then we're gonna have they're gonna steam. This smoke coming up is gonna steam it, and that's how you end up with your steak being gray. Okay, it's already ready to turn because our wok is nice and hot now after three batches. Okay. So that's almost done. That's about to come out and just a sec. What temperature are you cooking the steak, Asia? Um, so we're using high heat to cook it, and we are looking for a medium rare. So that's why we're only cooking the outside. It's still rare on the inside. So whenever you're doing a process where you're going to cook a meat more than once, you always want to undercook it the first time. So that way, on the second time, it comes up to the exact temperature you want. Okay, so that's done. So we're going to just give this wok a quick rinse because we want that temperature to come down. And we want to clear out any hot pieces, anything that, any burnt pieces that might be in the bottom. We want to get that out of there. I'm just going to grab a paper towel. Thank you so much. So let's wipe out our wok. Be very careful when you do this because it's hot. Even though we put some cool water on it, it's still very, very hot. So we're going to lower that heat down to medium high instead of high because that's just too much. For our lomo, we're gonna do this in batches. So you see how much steak we have here. We can maybe do two batches at a time on this. So we can cut it in half and half and do our batches like that. Just like with the siri, you don't wanna overcrowd the pan. It's so important to make sure that everything has its own space in here. So now that that is good to go, let's grab our rice and let's start to plate. So I'm gonna turn that off for just a sec. I'm gonna just turn that off for a minute because that's hot. So I'm using my cutting board here. You can use your cutting board to cut, but you can also use it to make sure you're not putting very hot things onto your countertop surfaces. Because uh, you don't want to burn it. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Okay, so we've got our rice here. So if we can come in close, we can see those nice pieces of garlic that we sliced earlier are in there and that garlic oil has not used the entire flavor of the rice and this is how you get your peruvian garlic rice oh my god that looks so good it looks good it smells good the steam i'm getting a whole facial right now <laughs> with this so we're gonna put our rice over to one side i'm plating this up like we're in a restaurant so we can it up we're not going we're not going shy on those portions and then i'm gonna grab some french fries so we're gonna grab some of these Gonna put those on the other side of the plate. Move these out of the way. And we wanna make ourselves a little city of French fries. Um, when I went to Peru for the first time, I had this really amazing lomo saltado in the city of Trujillo, which is in the northern part of Peru, at this restaurant called Fiesta. And they made their French fries. These like they looked made them like little bricks, and they did like a little Jenga situation with them that ended up being 
beautiful and it was so Azil didn't want to even eat his food because it looked so perfect so that's what we want we want to make sure that this dish is looks almost too perfect to eat so we've got that plated and ready to go i'm going to just move our rice out of the way and now we're going to move this plate over a little bit we'll put it right here so it's ready to go and let's just grab all of our other ingredients so that we can make this happen so i'm going to put them in the order that i'm going to use them so i like to start with my garlic first my i like to start with my garlic and my ají amarillo first because i want the ají amarillo to cook a little bit then i like to throw in my scallions then my red onion because i want them to still have some crunch then we've got our tomato and then we've got our steak so our steak is the last item that's going to go right here so let's put this here so we just got a nice good balance and then these are going to be our garnishes at the end and then we've got our sauce so the reason why i'm doing this we need to move fast once it's going it's go the train's not going to stop it's not going to stop moving the first time i did this i didn't know that and so the steak overcooked every the tomatoes overcooked, everything overcooked because i was still chopping things while things were already on the stove and if you're doing that you're already too late oh almost forgot most of, one of the most important ingredients secret ingredient this is pisco so pisco is a liqueur from peru that's made from grapes and so this bottle is very very special we opened it up just for this um this is esio's grandfather alfredo um lavarello cosio and he died in 2000, 2010 man it's been that long my hair has been 11 years i feel like that just happened we were just i guess we were still dating at the time but it doesn't feel that long ago. So this was over a decade ago. So we have had this peaceful for more than a decade. And we've just been moving it from house to house. We've been carrying from house to house, but we're also minimalists. And so we had a discussion about memories being in things. And so we said the memory is not in the thing. His spirit is not in the bottle. It's in us. So we decided that we were going to open it. So we're sharing that with you guys. Um, it's really, you know, he was a great man. Um, and he lived to be 97. Oh, I know it's not written on the bottle, but math right now. 93. I had to do the math. Um, all the way, all the men in SEO's family live really long, so I got a lot of decades ahead of me of doing this. So let's move it over here. And so we're going to move everything next to the stove so that we can have it all ready to go. So since we're going to divide this up into two batches, we're going to do half and half on each one. So I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna, okay. um, so I'm just gonna grab a couple of spoons so that we can easily get everything going. So I'm gonna put that heat back on. So we're gonna, this is gonna be something that's gonna move fast. So I'm gonna actually grab another bowl for the steak really quick. So this is what I do at home so that it's a lot easier because even just counting out the pieces of steak is going to be is going to slow us down too much so i'm going to divide this in half i'm going to take some of that steak i'm going to take half of it so that we can make a batch right here and you know what? let's have another plate kind of off to the side so that way when this is done we can just plate both at the same time so you see it's starting to smoke I don't have my oil in it yet because I didn't want my oil to burn. So I wanted to make sure that it's ready to go. So we're going to bring it up almost almost to the highest heat. Not quite high because we don't want it to burn. And we're going to throw in a little bit of oil. Just a little bit. So you can tell it's hot when your oil becomes more viscous. If you remember that from your science class, that's when the liquid is thin. So you can see the oil that's room temperature is, gonna, is a little bit thicker than what you see in the pan. Do you see how easily it moves around? That means it's hot, hot. So we're going to throw in our ají amarillo. Our garlic. Half of our scallion. And let's move that around real quick. Let's get that. Go. And then half of our red onion. This is just one red onion, one big one. Get that going. 
we'll let it go for a sec so that onion can cook just a little bit. And do you need a wok to do this? A wok is definitely preferred, but you can use whatever big pan you have, but you want to make sure it's your biggest pan that can get as hot as possible. So now we've got half of our tomato. Throw that in there. And once you throw in your tomato, that's when it's time to throw in your steak. So I've got my steak here, and then I'm also going to take a little bit of the, those juices. So a little bit of those juices in there. So that it's all together. So pour that in. And then mix it around. Woo! Almost lost an onion. We're going to throw in our sauce. And some so normally this is where you would flambe the whole situation if you've got if you have got a gas stove that's what's gonna happen it's gonna turn into fire I don't know if we got we've got a lighter but that's gonna be too much and now I'm gonna throw in a little bit of cilantro or you can use parsley as well just throw that in Boom, there we go. This is ready to go. So that's plates. So we're gonna, I like to start off with my steak, make sure everybody's getting a correct amount of steak and then top it with our vegetables. So those on top, get all, the, all that flavor from within it and then a little bit of our sauce. So we've got that on top. Just put this over here. I'm already doing my happy dance and I haven't even tried it yet. Yeah, it's so good. So let's get everything in there. And then we're going to garnish it. Oh, it's smoking in here. <coughs> this is a good dish to do with the windows open and to make sure that your hood is on. If you've got a hood on your stove, use it. Um, your fire alarm might go off. So I'm just going to garnish it with some cilantro and then I've got a little bit of green onion too to just give it, give it a little zing at the end. And this is it. This is our lomo saltado. This is our national dish of Peru. This is our filet mignon. This is our red onion, our tomato, our homemade french fries and our garlic rice all ready to go together. And so I'm going to give you a nice pose with it. And oh! I would be remiss if I did not mention I wear my new Dasha Sasson shirt. So we are going to be making some announcements this week. And one of those is going to be about some apparel options that we're going to have. So we're going to have shirts. Uh, we may have some other things too. And then on the back, you can see Dash of Sasson. That's us. If you're here, you're already following us probably. But tell a friend. Tell your mom. Tell everybody, especially if you're on Oahu. But even if you're not, if you want to just follow us online, you can get recipes like this. We'll teach you how to make everything you want to know. And that will be it. Thank you guys so much for being here.